Henry Darger is one of the most unusual and unique, I'd have to say strange, artists that we'll look at uh, in this class. In fact, we may not even want to call him an artist at all. He's just an unusual man who spent his life creating one of the most amazing works of fantasy, of visual and literal uh, picturing of his inner world. Uh, he's probably the longest story in English. It comes to 16,000 pages. He created this work without any input, but completely on his own. He didn't study art. He didn't show his art. He simply lived alone and spent all of his time creating this amazing story about the Vivian girls. He was born in 1892 and he lived until 1973. He had a kind of unhappy or one might say extremely unhappy uh, childhood, but really nobody knows because nobody knows anything about him. Nobody knew he was an artist until after he died. After he died, his landlord and landlady cleaned out his apartment and found this amazing work. What is known about his childhood is he lived with his father in Chicago for the first few years of his life. His mother died giving birth to his sister. He never saw his sister. And he was sent to a Catholic boys' home outside of Chicago at around the age of eight. His father stayed in Chicago and he died soon after. And Henry Darger was diagnosed as being feeble-minded. Feeble-minded was, at the time, a term for people who were slow at learning or had some mental retardation in some way. But it's not a very scientific evaluation, and for many people who were evaluated as feeble-minded, uh, it was completely untrue. Surely that's the case with Henry Darger. He stayed in the Catholic boys' home, uh, which we can imagine is very strict, very religious uh, punishments for small infractions. They had to work. They were not allowed to uh, enjoy themselves or go out freely. They were, in short, in a kind of prison. He escaped at the age of 16 and went back to Chicago. He got a job in a hospital as a janitor, who, a person who cleans up a custodian, and he worked at the same job for the next 50 years. At the age of 80, he finally got too sick to take care of himself, and he went to a nursing home where he died. When the landlord and landlady went to clean out his room, they found this amazing work. He had created the longest single story in the English language with visual accompaniment, with pictures and words and uh, little girls and boys and evil men and all of these images that we don't know where he would have picked them up. He didn't watch TV or listen to the radio, according to the landlord. He collected things. He walked around the city picking things up. He found magazines and newspapers and brought those home. He used those as the basis of his art. He went to church daily, mass, and uh, that is something that we can see, the imagery of the uh, Catholic Church we can see inside his work. And what he did the rest of the time was stay in his one room. He was a kind of recluse, a kind of hikikomori in a way. He worked and went to church, but the rest of the time he simply created. And what he created is one of the most unusual and amazing works ever produced. He called the work roughly the Vivian Girls, 
and it's a story of the unreal, a fantastic set of uh, images and battles and captures and escapes, uh, the child slave rebellion. Surely this must have come from his early terrible experience in the Catholic uh, boy's home where he was sent as a child and from which he escaped. So let's jump in and look at different aspects of this. I can only show you a small bit of it as it's 16,000 pages. We can't look at 16,000 pages, but we can look at uh, some of the most interesting ones. Um, I've organized it just a little bit to give you a kind of idea of the scope of what he's doing. But the story is basically about seven girls. We can see the girls here. Um, the girls are often naked. Uh, as you will notice if you look closely, the girls have uh, penis and testicles, many of them. He created this androgynous. Androgynous means mixed male-female uh, figure. They're girls, but boys too somehow. And it's the story of these good, perfect, pure girls who help protect children. And the Glandolinians are the evil uh, people who attack them and keep them uh, enslaved and torture them. And we'll see some really grisly scenes a little bit later. But here we can see the girls escaping. If you look, it's very comic book, manga-like style, but we see a lot of great work here. First of all, he's putting together many, many different uh, elements, right? We see this front part of the stone, the next part of this wood fence, uh, the tree in great detail, the clouds, always he's in the clouds. We were looking west here. Uh, and the girls are always moving, right? Running or jumping or uh, skipping, right? Uh, through this lush uh, natural environment and uh, into the artificial environment, too. He spends a lot of time on flowers, outsized flowers. He has a tremendous sense of depth, right? The distance of these clouds in the back, the close-up of the sunflowers and the other uh, camellias, different uh, flowers up close. Uh, the girls live in a kind of uh, Eden of sorts, uh, which of course is invaded by the Glandolinians um, who come to attack them. Look at the birds back here. Look at the apples up in the tree, the detail on the clouds. Uh, the danger off screen, as it were, here. But also look how he uses four pages mixed together to show uh, different aspects, to show a bigger view, a huge panoramic view of the battle between the Vivian girls, who are good, and the Glandolinians, who are evil. The faces are also really spectacular. There's not just motion, skipping and running, fighting these girls with the uh, guns, with the huge saber. But look at the girl up here. Look at the girl worried here. Look at this confident girl, the other girl, uh, looking at the flowers. So filled with energy and different uh, elements that we can't imagine where he could pick all this up. He didn't watch movies. He didn't read much other than these comic books and magazines. Uh, he simply had all of this inside his head somewhere. Here again we see the Vivian girls escaping. We see the evil soldiers attacking. The dark clouds give us the evil to come. These girls racing off to the village and again, every scene is described in a few words, but the words are huge, a vast amount of information.
this marvelous triptych, which is the word triptych, three parts, is part of a religious painting of all sorts, uh, Buddhist, Christian, all kinds of painting. Uh, we see the war raging back here, the explosion here, uh, the girls deciding what to do at Sunbeam Creek. Um, not a real place as far as I know, but uh, it's certainly a beautiful image. He also went into tremendous detail about the battles, the war between the naked girls and the evil Glandolinians, uh, although there's some good guys here as well, the good cowboy over here, the evil soldiers here. Uh, he really shows us a pretty grim picture uh, and very violent. So if you don't like violence, I apologize. Uh, you can skip ahead a little bit. Um, the nudity, of course, seems very odd for a man who uh, never married and uh, perhaps never even saw uh, a naked woman, as far as anybody knows. He wasn't married, didn't have a girlfriend or anything like that. He lived at the boy's home and then he lived by himself. Uh, so where he got this idea of nudity is a little bit hard to understand, but we can see that it's really important in terms of how he creates meaning. Here the seven Vivian girls are about to be attacked. They have their bat, a little thing to play, and their innocence and purity is contrasted with the evil. These hats are taken from a German World War I style hats. Many of the uniforms are from the Civil War as well as from World War I and World War II. Later there's some. Here we can see the torture of these girls, their tongues coming out uh, as they are grabbed and strangled by the evil captors. And again, the purity of the girls in the front is maintained even while they're being abused. More torture buried in the sand. Uh, Sedernine is not a real place. He's making up all of these places, all of the names, all of the battles are all coming out of his imagination. Poor girl strangled there on the pedestal. A beautiful sunny day, he creates a sense of irony and a sense of horror, right? between the beautiful blue sky with the white clouds and these poor girls trapped and the evil guys bowing to each other as they strangle them. The scenes get very violent at points. Um, he's always using the wind and the weather to express a lot of his feeling. There's thunderstorms, lightning, Cyclone is like a tornado, a terrible storm, and the faces here on these men are like a skull, right? Always a symbol of evil, of death. And uh, the girls are falling, and the cyclone um, saves them. So the girls are in touch with nature, unlike the evil soldiers. Uh, nature always helps them, saves them, lets them escape. And one of the interesting parts, too, you'll notice this word brutally is misspelled, but that's his misspelling, right? He was not an educated man. He must have gone to school at some point at the boys' home to learn how to read. Uh, he wrote a lot, but he makes very, very interesting misspellings, interesting mistakes in the words. Uh, of course, he's creating a lot, making a lot of production of everything, but here the girls are always escaping. They're very clever. They're smarter than the men. <laughs> These hats are interesting. 
that's a traditional hat worn uh, for graduation, so a symbol of uh, educated or intelligent people. The face over here looks like uh, Adolf Hitler a little bit, and the uniforms are very old ones, uh, more from the Civil War than from World War I or World War II. Uh, the hundreds and hundreds of paintings that he made were basically done with watercolor. He traced the figures. Uh, tracing means to uh, copy, right, from the magazines and comic books that he took. Uh, most of them are just kind of regular paper size, A4, but uh, he put them together into huge pieces, depending on what he found. Uh, he gathered most of the paper and most of the watercolor and crayon and pen that he used, but uh, he also bought some with his earnings. He created uh, very small and focused elements, but also a huge, uh, enlarged, sometimes they're 10 feet long, right, about three meters long, unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And he's able to focus on very, very small details, but also this huge view, which is really, really stunning. He uses very simple techniques and very simple materials to create this just phenomenal world of battles and escapes and all of the story hasn't yet been put together but it's really really fascinating look at this great lightning and the girls coming to rescue uh, their sister and uh, many of the scenes of course are contrasted just like this the terrible suffering and torture and the great freedom and fantasy uh, that he puts there. All of the words is all uh, filled with drama and action and violence. He creates this constant sense of motion, right? The girls are all moving around and stillness over here. So still and in motion. And look at this scene, this battle scene here, right? Uh, the composition is something more than just hand-drawn, easy images. He's really creating a composed landscape with a very, very unique and personal vision. This is not something that you would see anywhere else, even inside comic books or fantasy, even inside anime, which of course came much, much later than this. You would never see this scale of destruction, right? Look at all the explosions here. The yellow is contrasted with the gray, this nighttime battle. Uh, some things are clear in the light, others are hidden in darkness. Uh, the black contrasting with the yellow, really kind of stunning way of covering everything, right? A little bit like Jackson Pollock, right? He covers the whole scene. Here's some more brutal and ugly uh, images. And again, uh, just like the nakedness, it's hard to imagine where he could have seen uh, the horrifying things here. Uh, the Vivian girl princesses are forced to witness frightful murder massacre of children. Uh, and the brutal, bloody scenes he might have gotten from uh, art, but look at the faces, the unconcerned faces of these evil people. Uh, and the poor girls being cut into smaller, uh, bloody pieces. Of course, it's a happy ending. Um, the violence and destruction uh, is 
set aside as the Vivian girls get the other soldiers to help them. Here the Vivian girls are always hiding and outsmarting the stupid evil soldiers. And uh, we get this kind of amazing, again, contrast between good purity higher up, almost in the clouds of the trees and the evil down below. The images of violence and blood and torture that we just saw are a kind of contrast with the beauty of the girls, the cleverness, the smartness, the purity, right? And there's a, little, a lot of humor here too, right? The girls roll themselves up into uh, floor rugs in order to escape in the scene. Uh, they're brave, these girls. They're brave and smart and free and uh, good, right? And again and again, Henry Darger shows us this contrast. Uh, the Vivian girls escape once again. Uh, the dumb generals are talking away while the girls escape. Uh, new outfits here, purple, yellow. We can see they set fire to the house as they run away. Uh, we see the girls hidden here behind, spying on them. So they're kind of, uh, the Vivian girls are kind of superheroes, right? And here is a scene signing the uh, peace agreement. Uh, the girls are standing around, the paper in their hands. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus on the cross, and Mother Mary. These images are purely uh, from the Catholic Church. But look at all the detail on the girls. They're all in uniforms, right? Girls' uniforms, girls' soldiers' uniforms. Again, here's more of the Christian imagery. The hands of fire is an image from the Bible. The hands of fire will come down uh, and uh, set the world aright. The girls are woken up in the middle of the night by these hands of fire at some place, again, fantasied place, calls Okun. The war is over here, too. We get a sense of the end of the battle. The girls are there. Uh, the good soldiers, clearly, are here. The girls are playing and looking around. But look at all the detail, right? The images of the seven Vivian girls in the wall up here and the good uh, judge here. Uh, everything is as it should be, one naked girl down here, but everybody else is clothed. One of the other aspects of the Vivian girl story is these fantastic creatures that he made. Um, Tuskerhorian, headed Dortherian, <laughs> who knows what those are? No idea, but they look dragon, butterfly, girl, uh, angel. Uh, look at the face on this one. Her face and claws here. This mixture of types of beings is really, really fascinating. Here's girls with a tail uh, and uh, rams. Again, this is a male sheep, not a female sheep. So this mixture of male and female is so intriguing. The um, many of the early philosophers and psychologists who studied uh, the unconscious, uh, such as Carl Jung, said that humans have both male and female inside of them. It's mixed together, and that humans also have this. Uh, intelligent, uh, rational mind, but also this reptilian animal nature. So in some ways it seems that Henry Darger is really going into his unconscious mind, unconscious mind inherited from the history of humans 
and pulling out these images which have appeared in all sorts of fantasies, stories, religion, belief systems, all through the history of, of the human race. Uh, the story by the philosopher Plato, right, Platon, is of men and women once being connected together, but as punishment, they were separated into male and female, but they used to be joined together with four arms and four legs. So many cultures have this story of mixed male and female uh, character. These are really wonderful kind of snake, serpent, dragons here. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Blen Giglomenian. Who knows? But what a fantastic, beautiful little image. The black dark of the cave, the uh, serpent coming out, the uh, seven Vivian girls at peace with this nature, this elemental, earthbound, expression of power and force, right? Snakes are important in all the world and carries great symbolic meaning. And here the girls are completely at peace with these creatures. Gigantic Roverine. Roverine is about the most normal sounding one. It seems like there should be a Roverine, but look, look how long the tail is stretching back into the back and the other half serpent, half butterfly images. Fantastic. But in addition to the fantasy elements, um, he's also creating a very, very human story. Here the girls are talking amongst themselves, right? The girl on the left says, I once hit General Manley with a stone and I am afraid of the enemy ever since. In the middle, she says, what or who is after you that scares you so? And the one on the right says, I do not know what is the matter. She has been running like mad every time I see her. And she looks so scared and yet angry. Why? Great. Just this human worry. So it's not just a panorama, a huge story of fighting, but also lots and lots of close up we can say this is, in some ways, taken straight from a magazine, copied. Surely he didn't draw this freehand. But look at the detail on her hair and her dress. The look on her face conveys so much. Another girl here blowing a balloon. Maybe she's another creature with wings. And uh, this marvelous fantasy background here, the uh, palm trees and some sort of unusual flower there. This girl climbing out of the water as if she's taking a bath or crying or sad. And look at these girls too. He's put Christmas stamps along here uh, on the outside. Uh, of course, he has nobody to mail a letter to. He lived all alone, had no friends, hardly any contacts. And these girls are a very, very haunting, I think, image. Um, not missing one of the seven girls here, but uh, again, look at the kind of motion and delicacy. She looks like she's swinging. She looks like she's sitting up. She's leaning forward, leaning back at ease looking out. Uh, he hasn't finished the eyes there, but uh, it's still a kind of beautiful watercolor work. The girls in front of the forest, coming out of the forest. Well, the this is Henry Darger. Was he totally insane? Is he a kind of hikikomori jiheisho mentally unstable person or is he a kind of genius well i think the question arises what is art art is a kind of madness a kind of craziness 
And to create art is very similar to uh, kind of losing your mind. It's to move out of the normal into a very, very different state. And we wonder really what he thought, but nobody could ever interview him. It would be just wonderful to know what his idea was. What was he thinking? What was he trying to do? Uh, this is his, uh, the building he lived in for 50 years. He had the back room uh, at the back of this building. And this is in Chicago, just average street, average place. And, you know, the back room is the source of this marvelous, huge, long story. Here's his room, uh, dark, dingy, uh, seems a little depressing in a way. We can see all his watercolors in the front, all the images that he hung up around him. We can see uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph here, uh, image of a girl here, some smiling girl, something else from a magazine, stacks of things everywhere. This is his typewriter. He started to type out the story, uh, which I think is very, very intriguing. He wanted to put it into a form to be saved. We can see uh, this image, which we saw before, uh, books, uh, watercolor. These are watercolors, uh, pencils, crayons over here, more uh, either watercolor or perhaps acrylic, maybe oil paint, the images of these girls that he used. Again, this is another shot of his room. This is how he had things stacked up, huge stacks. This is part of the story here. All of this packed up. And again, the we'll never know what he really thought about it because no one had ever spoken to him about it. Nobody knew about it. He just did all this all on his own, all alone. He never intended to show it to anybody. Perhaps his typing it was some final attempt to put it into form that somebody might read other than himself, but he never finished typing it. And we can see all his the swirl of images that he has here around him stacks and stacks and stacks of things here's some of the folded up stories uh, pages that he has here and here is his grave uh, which is in Chicago he didn't have any money when he died he was uh, all alone and uh, he had a beautiful, I think, gravestone here, artist, <laughs> lovely. But more important, maybe down below, protector of children, lovely. He, of course, did present a story of good against evil, and good wins out. He was a protector of children in his story, he created this work where uh, the morality of good and evil is really clear. Uh, innocence and the evil is set side by side. He has this marvelous inner world of his own mind, which is both delightful and very, very disturbing. He somehow feels more in touch with his own mind, the evil side, the violent, horrifying, bloody, terrible aspects of the human mind. But he also has the beautiful, pure, wonderful aspects of the human mind. But he's able to mix those together. And that's what's really intriguing. How could he keep producing this work all alone? We think of artists or writers or creative people as wanting to do something and show it off. But he's not like that. It's as if he has no ego. He has no need for people to see what he's doing. He's so satisfied 
with telling his own story, the story that he, he lives in, he's so satisfied with telling this story to himself, to be with himself, to be alone. And that's one of the most amazing parts of his whole story. For homework, I'd like you to give me your opinion of Henry Darger. Uh, what do you think about him? What motivated him? Question number one, what motivated him? Question number two, what does his art show us about art? He has something really important to offer us to make us rethink about art and, of course, about ourselves, our creative aspect. So what does his work tell us about art? And third, he gives us a marvelous story. So I want you to tell me, even though you haven't read all of the story, uh, how important are stories, the creative side of almost all of the artists we've looked at has involved stories. So question number three is, how important is telling a story to the creation of art? Have fun answering and take a look back at the beginning. Go through and look at some of these slides. Uh, I'll put the slides up on e-learning as well so you can watch them again. Be creative.